Go ahead. I'm, I'm Pam Mitchell. <laughs> I'm Ricky Mitchell. And we moved here from Texas in September of 2020. So To follow our grandchild. <laughs> You know, I've thought about this a lot uh, because I come from an education background. I, that's where I immediately went. But I thought, you know, this is this is something we've been working on to really be to explicitly include people for you know decades. But you know, as we look at our world, inclusion has has grown um, throughout the, all of society. I'm, I'm grateful for that. But I think one of the things that I keep thinking is it's about acceptance because we went from a culture of to tolerating people to accepting people for who they are, um, no matter what walk of life they come from, no matter what, you know, their race, gender, and uh, so it's grown a lot, uh, even more so to me through the United Methodist Church. For me, it's th there are two books that really played a, a big part of that. One of them is White Fragility, mm -hmm. which is mostly about race, but can be, in, you know, kind of translated across across a lot of, of scenes. But the other one is called Beyond Magenta, and it's a great book about transgender kids and what they go through. And it really opened my eyes to a lot of things that I had not realized. And so uh, inclusion is, yeah, it's about acceptance, but it's, it's about getting them involved and, and treating them like we do everybody and anybody and respecting what, what their wishes are to be a whole person. And I think the church plays a vital role in that because we are the first, we are that, that first level of safety. We should always be the first level of safety. Uh, society, social media can be so toxic if we're not careful. And I think that the church has to be that, that level of safety where everybody's included in the hug. One of my favorite times of, of the church service is in the beginning when, you know, during the greeting and it's like, you know, restating what our beliefs are and, um, you know, that, that we are a reconciling congregation, but also that uh, you know, it just, it's, it's kind of a reminder, but then we pass the peace and watching, uh, you know, we're in the choir, so ours is pretty limited, you know, we don't step out, but watching people reach across the aisle and, and um, walk around and really getting to have that first, you know, that first opportunity to really reach out to somebody who doesn't necessarily look like you and you know it's not you don't always see just you know people with gray hair going to people with gray hair I mean you see you see people all the way through the congregation and and to me that's like you know of course that surface level um, but it also speaks to you know eventually those relationships do form and that's really what it's about but, you know and, and we've watched um, what happens when a church has a toxic environment and you know when you have people who are new in their faith you know it not only tests their faith it just knocks their feet out from under them and um, and often it pushes people away from God and that's you know and 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 of course you know when you're new in your faith you assume that the people that you're surrounded by in that church reflect what God is and so if we were supposed to reflect what God is, God is love. And, and um, God created us. And, you know, and, and we are perfect in His eyes, in God's eyes. You know, and so it's like we are, uh, we are perfect beings. And for a church, that means that we accept people in, in, as who they are. And uh, so, I, you know, are, are we the people who carry the message of God? Are we the people who carry the message of, you know, you're not like me, I don't agree with you, and, you know, so I, I do think it's important. You become more open mm -hmm. and welcoming. Right. Uh, even if you are at first, and I speak from personal experience, if I'm at first resistant or um, uncomfortable with what somebody's saying, uh, you can learn who they are, and then you can really hear and listen to what they say. Yeah. But um, 
Yeah, in the most recent examples, I think you're right. It's the variety of people mm -hmm. and the backgrounds, and it's wonderful to develop together um, a shared um, appreciation and recognition right. of what matters and is of value to us, and to hear it from other people's background perspective yeah. and cultural perspective. We've grown up that with is a amazing. huge cultural that is amazing. Um, population here of many cultures and grew up with that as well, which was kind of amazing at the time. But I think that's really important too, to be able to really learn how to love your neighbor as yourself isn't always the easiest thing to do. And I think that that's another opportunity for us to learn how to live together in unity, under God, through Jesus, together. For, for me, um, pretty much all my professional life, I've been a church staff member as a, as a music director, gosh, like I say, most of my life, and in particular the last uh, five or six years full-time music minister, and to watch how the sausage is made in the church uh, really tells you about the importance of inclusion, the importance of acceptance beyond beyond just acknowledgement, but at a deeper level. And so I've worked in churches that were both, that had some toxic points and some churches that didn't. And so it's been a, it's been a real eye opener to see what I really want in, in the deconstruction and reconstruction of my own faith. That we have had Bible study uh, in the church, but also outside of the church with people who come from a whole different part of the world where you're not even allowed to tell your next door neighbor that you're doing anything like that. And sometimes we've had people who have been so harmed by their experience with churches and organized religion that they're very skeptical. And we can't use any of our usual Christianese language. And we have to also then be very careful of how uh, self-assured we come across because they're struggling and we need to be in the struggle with them. I think we were both raised that way. Both of our, you know, our parents were very involved in everything that we did, but, you know, I don't remember ever missing anything at church, and, and uh, Ricky was the same way. And so we, we continued that, we had great examples. Um, but seriously, I mean, to me, we just find great joy. And, and I think one of the things we both have realized through the years that um, if everybody does a little, it's not a lot of work. And we've been in churches where we did it all, you know, us and two other couples or something, but it's lovely to be part of a congregation where there are a lot of volunteers. And every time we come here, we some see somebody different in a different role. Um, so that's been a lot of fun because we are retired. We can come during the day and we see that. And that's part of it. We're both type A's. You know, personality-wise, we're very driven, and so we're not sit around at home type people. We've got to be up and be active and be doing something. So, finding the church and, and having the opportunity to serve was just one of the ways. But again, it's it is. I'm a cradle Methodist. I recruited her over from the Baptist, but <laughs> you know, service was something that was always a big part of that. And time is just part of what we give in our in our vows. For me, when I first started working for the church and got a paycheck, mom had already I had always worked for the church, and I said, "Mom, what do I do with this paycheck?" I said, "I don't know. You know, I give to the church. I don't let the church give to me." And she said, "No, you take the money, but you give back." And she said, "You give back what you're supposed to." She said, "The tithe is ten percent, so you give back, you know, what you can." I went. I, as a young married couple, there was no way we could do ten percent. Well, I said, "Oh no, I can't do ten percent," but. I, I went from writing the check to the church, when we wrote checks, from doing it last to doing it first. And then I realized that, hey, let me add a little bit more, let me add a little bit more, until we finally got to that 10% that threshold. And we were always, everything always worked out. And I never really understood that. I still don't. It's a step of faith. We're, we're big on faith. We don't ask a lot of questions. We just kind of take the step and, and go with it. And so it's a step of faith. And I think once you make that step, you realize uh, what, what good things can happen. 
And I, you know, and I was being raised Baptist, it was very much, you know, it's kind of a, you know, you follow the rules kind of thing. And, um, but I, I don't think it, it ever hit me what, um, the heart part of it until, really until I became a Methodist. And, and so I think that's kind of the, uh, the joy that you take from it. But also one of the things, uh, you know, and if you have a Baptist background, I'm not slamming that. I'm just saying in my teeny tiny, you know, world, you know, that's how it was. So don't, you know. I don't, it's okay, you know, don't, I'm not saying anything about that, but, um, but I will say that one of the things that we kind of learned too, especially being part of the music ministry, is that, you know, we, we do the tithe, and, and we have for a very long time, and um, even when we were very broke, um, and which was a lot of our lives, and, um, and so those extra ministries need a boost sometimes and that means giving above and beyond your tithe because you give to the church but then if you want to give to the music program you you can do that but don't don't take from you know from the core because um, you know you, you the church has to be first well I think we have so many things that are um, really wonderful going on here and, and really focusing on inclusion focusing on um, housing and how we can help those that need help. Um, another thing that I would hope would be to focus on um, working with and enjoying membership for people who are um, perhaps handicapped in uh, many ways. Um, that is a challenge for many churches and I think it's real important. Um, I think of children because that's been my life's work is working with children with special needs. And I would like us to see, to develop some programming for kids with special needs in the future. I think that the, the wider dream is that we can become more inclusive. We can help to solve problems. We can help to uh, bring the message of God's love to everyone in the Portland area, regardless of, of what faith they happen to embrace, we can do that. And that's an ambitious goal, but I think it is entirely possible within the, the outreach of our, our wider vision.